Hello and welcome to part 3 of topic 5 on thermal properties of polymers. In this part of the lecture we'll be focusing on different techniques for measuring thermal properties of polymers. First of all is or first up is differential thermal analysis. In DTA the idea is that we heat both a sample and a reference material at the same rate so that we monitor and then we monitor the temperature of the two materials as the temperature is gradually increased. In, th in this situation, the difference in temperature between the sample and the reference should always be zero unless a transition occurs, such as the melting point, in which case more heat will be pumped into the sample that undergoes melting, and it will see a constant temperature, so the difference between the sample and the reference will gradually increase. So as this plot shows, initially at low temperatures, the difference between the reference and the sample is equal to zero, but then when the, the melting point is approached, the transition the, the uh, temperature differential suddenly increases and we see that we get a transition and then it decreases again and we return to zero as the samples continue to be heated at the same rate. This can also be used to measure the glass transition temperature materials and you get a simple, similar transient response with a sudden increase in the temperature differential between the sample and the reference. Differential scanning calorimetry is a technique we've already talked about, and it's a technique that's typically used to measure thermal transitions within a range of approximately minus 180 degrees Celsius, or liquid nitrogen temperatures, and up to 600 degrees Celsius, and it's a slightly less accurate than differential thermal analysis. The upside to DSC, however, is that we actually measure the heat that is taken into the material as a function of temperature. So, for example, if I wanted to know how much crystallinity was present in the material, I would measure the area under the crystal melt energy, under the crystal melt peak, I should say, and that becomes the crystal melt en energy. Be and this is an endothermic reaction, so that that heat is taken in by the system in order to cause that, that melting process to occur. This becomes the heat of fusion of the sample at the melting point, delta H sub S. Delta H sub C is the heat of fusion of a similar polymer that's 100% crystalline at the melting point. By taking the ratio of the heat of fusion of our sample to the heat of fusion of 100% crystalline material, we can determine the percent crystallinity of the polymer. We can determine a number of other things from the DSC plot. As we've discussed before, the glass transition temperature can be determined by the small increase in heat flow necessary to cause um, continuing temperature rise. This is due to a change in the specific heat of the polymer at the glass transition temperature. We can also measure the transition for recrystallization in the polymer, or what's called cold crystallization, and the energy required to crystallize the polymer at elevated temperatures. We then see the temperature for melting. Then there is a higher temperatures beyond the melting point. We get peroxide reactions in which the polymer chain begins to break down and, and undergo chain scission due to oxidation. And then finally, you might experience cross-linking the polymer before the final degradation of the polymer. Thermomechanical analysis is another technique, also known as TMA. It measures the change in shape of the material by pressing a rod up against the sample as the sample is heated. A displacement transducer measures the displacement of the rod as a function of temperature. This allows us to calculate the coefficient of thermal expansion as the change in the dimension of the sample divided by the change in temperature times 1 over the original length of the material. This gives us what's known as the linear coefficient of thermal expansion, or alpha sub L. The volumetric coefficient of thermal expansion is equal to 3 times the linear co coefficient of thermal expansion, but this applies only to isotropic materials. So if you're dealing with a composite which is not isotropic, this rule does not apply. The last technique I'd like to discuss is thermogravi thermogravimetry analysis. In this technique, we basically heat a polymer to very high temperatures and measure the change in mass of the sample as a function of time and temperature, specifically a temperature. If we look at the plot on the left, we notice it's measuring the weight percent of the sample. So the sample starts out at 100% weight at relatively low temperatures, but then at a temperature of approximately 150 degrees Celsius, we see a, a slight decrease in the mass of the sample. This corresponds to a sudden change in the, what's called the derivative weight, or the percent change in weight per degree Celsius. This little spike down here in the spectrum. 
According to the analysis of this polymer, which happens to be PVC or polyvinyl chloride, this is the release of volatiles, possibly solvents that were present in the polymer during processing. Then at a slightly higher temperature, we see another drop off and more mass is lost. This is due to the burning of plasticizers that are added to the PVC to make it more ductile. At a higher temperature yet of 264 degrees Celsius, the mass drops dramatically as the, the chloride atoms are broken off of the chain and hydrogen chloride gas is formed. Then at even higher temperatures, the carbon-carbon bonds are broken and you begin to form carbon black soot at 440 degrees Celsius. And finally at 721 degrees Celsius, there's another drop in mass and CO2 is formed from combustion of the polymer. The remaining material is primarily ash and it about, makes up about 8% of the mass of the polymer. The remaining 92% has been burned off as, as combustion products. By